Okay, well, thanks very much. And thanks so much to uh, Robin Cybera for the invitation to come and speak. Uh, I, I was telling a couple of people out front, and I'm going to have to, and I'll, I'll mention to you that I, this comes with a caveat, the kind of caveat that gets my kids' eyes uh, rolling once they know Dad's going to start talking about copyright and law and uh, those sorts of issues. And that's to say that this is a bit more of a law profish type keynote than candidly I would typically give. Um, usually, of course, especially for an opening keynote at, at a conference as good as this, uh, it, it's a bit more high level. I'm going to get a little bit more in the weeds when it comes to some of the things that are taking place. And that is because I, I, the main message, I'm going to give it all up front, is that uh, there is a timeliness and an urgency to the sorts of issues that I'm going to put on the table right now. The, the rules of the digital road are being set right now. And really what I want to do is spend some time talking about what those proposed rules are uh, and encourage everyone in the room because it so deeply affects what our networks looks like, frankly, what our country is going to look like, uh, to get informed and where possible to speak out. So, so the title is Canada's National Digi Digital Strategy Hidden in Plain Sight. And for those that follow issues around digital strategies, you know that Canada has been waiting for a digital strategy for quite some time. Many, uh, many countries, many of the kinds of countries that we would think of as peers have actually developed digital strategies, have had them in place for some time. And there are many who would argue that Canada has gradually fallen behind some of those countries when it comes to our infrastructure, when it comes to the sort of innovative companies that we're looking for, in part because of a lack of leadership in this area. Now, a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago or so, the, the government launched a consultation on, on a digital economy strategy. A little under a year ago, we had an update from the then minister, Tony Clement, saying it was on the way. Um, but of course, in the period since November 2010 and now, we've had another uh, election and a new minister. And if you take a look at some of the, the speeches that the newest minister, Christian Paradis, has been giving, uh, the words digital economy strategy have now disappeared from the text of the speeches that he has given, at least recently. Uh, so he talks about some of the component parts of a digital economy strategy, but uh, in the way in which Clement focused on the need for a comprehensive strategy that will guide what Canada does over the next decade is now missing. Um, and I think for many that's a, a cause for concern because while we see the headlines that talk about Canada being the, amongst the heaviest users, the largest users of the internet, I think many people in this room will know and acknowledge that we face some pretty significant issues right now. Um, we have some great innovative companies, but the big names that are out there are now rarely Canadian and to the extent to which they, they are Canadian, they are in the headlines, it seems sometimes, for all the wrong reasons as opposed to some, for some of the right ones. Um, these are the sorts of graphs and slides that uh, have now become commonplace as when organizations like the OECD and others take a look at where Canada ranks in comparison to uh, other countries, the sorts of countries that we used to think of uh, as, as us being a leader, whether it's on broadband pricing or on wireless, uh, consistently the numbers show us lagging rather than leading. There's no shortage of disputes, uh, particularly from the carriers, about the validity of some of these studies. But the reality is that study after study all shows the same basic trends. Nobody suggests that Canada has, is the leader that it thought of, that it once thought it was uh, a decade or so ago. And I have to say that I think Canadians are taking notice. We, of course, had earlier this year the very public fight over usage-based billing, UBB, where the Vancouver-based group Open Media generated nearly a half a million uh, people participating in an online petition on UBB. They've since become engaged in some other issues as well. And it's clear that the government, certainly on UBB, took notice uh, as they actually asked the CRTC to stop implementing the policy they were about to implement with respect to usage-based billing and reconsider the issue. Companies are certainly paying attention to what's been taking place in Canada. Netflix has, of course, been a huge success in Canada in terms of establishing some fairly significant market share in very short order. Uh, and yet, uh, within months, it also announced that it was going to offer up a different version of its streamed uh, content for Canadians because of the data caps that we face, the hidden costs that many consumers were facing for what was otherwise a good price plan, and they quickly found they were exceeding their caps. And so Canada, uh, unlike some other countries, found that it, its Netflix service was available um, with less, using less data. And of course, the market itself is paying attention. We just had the digital transition 
on the broadcast side from analog to digital, but still a lot of questions around what happens next, uh, particularly to that spectrum, to the, the new entrants that we've had in the wireless marketplace, who were the beneficiaries of a set aside a couple of years ago that have allowed some new competition in the wireless marketplace, but we're not sure for how long. And so I think many people take a look at that environment, at this current environment in Canada, and say, well, there, there is no strategy. And now the minister isn't even talking about a strategy at all either. Uh, and I think it's certainly true that on many policy issues, the occasional law issue, but on many policy issues, we are still waiting to hear precisely what this government has in mind, whether that's the forthcoming spe spectrum auction on the freed up spectrum, the 700 megahertz spec spectrum, uh, whether that's foreign investment and whether we're going to open things up, whether that's the issue of broadcasting on the Internet, which the CRTC issued a ruling on uh, or a decision on just yesterday with respect to whether or not it might seek to regulate. There are lots of issues that are, are currently on the table. And so I think it's certainly fair game to say that we don't have a digital economy strategy on many of those policies. But at the same time, for those that, that aren't paying close attention to what's happening from a legal perspective, I think it's fair to say that the government has almost completely identified what its legal strategy is. The legal rules of this digital road have either been passed, are currently before Parliament, two bills that I'm going to talk about in a couple of minutes introduced just last week, or being introduced imminently. And so the reality is that there is at least a legal digital strategy, and I, as the title suggests, I think it's hidden in plain view. It's there for all to see, though we often don't hear it, described in the context of being what that digital economy strategy for Canada is going to be look like. Well, it's about copyright, it's about privacy, and it's important to connect the dots and recognize that what is actually being established are the rules of that digital road for Canada, the rules of the digital road that will be with us for decades, and if we don't get it right, incredibly difficult to undo. I want to talk about four of them this morning and then ensure that there's a bit of time for questions so that we have the opportunity to engage a little bit. The first off is one that hasn't been reintroduced yet, but is expected to be introduced uh, within the next number of weeks. And it is, in a sense, the digital surveillance rules, a direct impact on what our net networks look like. It's what's frequently described as lawful access. Now, uh, lawful access dates back a long time, well over a decade, and it's all about uh, law enforcement seeking to ensure that the sorts of powers and tools that it has to deal with crime work as well in the online environment, in the digital networked environment, as they do in the offline environment. And I think all would agree that that's a completely reasonable goal. Uh, the challenge has been to identify both where the shortcomings are with respect to taking our existing rules and moving them into that digital environment, and ensure that we do so in a way that retains our competitiveness in the marketplace, ensures that our privacy is adequately protected, and ensures that we have the appropriate level of oversight. That has proven incredibly challenging to accomplish. And so we've had successive governments, both liberal and conservative, this is not, and I, I, would, I would suggest that virtually all of these issues are not partisan issues. Lawful access is not a partisan issue. It was first introduced by the liberal government. In fact, when the conservatives followed up with their first lawful access bill, the official response from the Liberal Party was, what took you so long? Uh, so this isn't a matter of saying this is a conservative issue or a liberal issue, it's a matter of getting the policy right. Conservatives have introduced this now on a couple of occasions, or, and uh, as I say, they were, ex actually it was expected that they would introduce it in the omnibus crime bill that was introduced in the first week of the, the new session last month. Uh, that didn't happen, but there's every reason to believe that it's forthcoming within the next number of weeks. Let me describe what the Conservatives have in mind, because there's every reason to believe that what they introduced last time will be reintroduced again. And I think it's helpful to think of lawful access, in a sense, as being three layers. The first layer has to do with information that must be provided, mandatory, prov ma being provided on a mandatory basis by network providers to law enforcement with no court oversight. The rule right now in Canada, under Canadian privacy law, is that law enforcement can come knocking, and if it's part of a lawful investigation, the network provider has the option to provide that information with no court oversight. That is the, where the law stands today, and if you're dealing with, say, a child endangerment case, most, though not all, ISPs will say, this is the sort of thing that we're going to provide you with some of that basic subscriber information. Uh, time is of the essence. 
However, the law also says that if a network provider wants to ensure that there is appropriate oversight before they hand over their subscriber information, they can say, come back with a warrant and I'll give you whatever I like. The first layer of what lawful access seeks to do is to say we're going to remove the option of disclosure and make it mandatory. Now this is described by the government as just customer name and address information, the sort of stuff that is read, uh, just readily available. The minister has said this is not personal information uh, and thus nobody should really be concerned about the privacy implications. This is the list of the sorts of information, at least in the last bill, that the government had in mind and recognize that while even something as basic as name and address may not sound particularly private, it is readily, much, much of that information is readily available. The very reason that law enforcement is seeking it is that it holds the key to a vast amount of other information. The whole point is to try to connect the dots between the other information that may have been accumulated and an actual name and address, or as you can see in this case, large numbers of other identifiers, many of which I think many, many of us would agree go well beyond the notion of basic information one might find in a telephone directory that would otherwise be readily available. The law will say this must be disclosed, no court oversight uh, whatsoever. And so the first layer is to provide law enforcement with the ability to access that information. I would argue that this probably almost more than any other issue in lawful access is the core problem. That fundamental principle of saying that in appropriate circumstances, courts ought to be exercising some amount of oversight will be gone, at least in these situations. Now the second layer is the one that impacts the network most directly, because on the one we start with Let's get the name and address and all the various other identifiers. The second layer within lawful access says, okay, let's ensure that the network provider has surve the surveillance capabilities we need to conduct real-time surveillance on the network. And there are a whole series of new obligations that would come out of this legislation, uh, many of which lead to, I think, to, to a lot of people to conclude that what we're really talking about is a full regulated infrastructure. The provision of network services for ISPs will become a highly regulated industry. Regulated not by the traditional bugaboo of the CRTC, but instead by law enforcement. Because what you face, as you can see on this large list, are a whole series of capabilities when it comes to the equipment itself uh, and from an operational perspective. Everything from providing law enforcement with the names of your employees uh, who would be involved in participating with surveillance activities alongside law enforcement so that the RS RCMP can do background checks. Where ISPs are bought and sold, someone acquires new, a new network, they're required to disclose that to law enforcement so that there's the ability to identify whether or not they've retained the same kinds of surveillance capabilities. Indeed, all network providers will be required to disclose their network infrastructure, the equipment they have, and the like within months of this law taking place. What this ensures from a law enforcement perspective is that they know exactly what each network provider is capable of doing and they want to ensure that they've got the capabilities to engage, as you can see, in enabling interception, isolating communication, providing some of the prescribed information, and engage in multiple interceptions. Indeed, the law talks about law enforcement coming in in advance, working with network providers to ensure that those capabilities are in place working with the very people that they've now conducted background checks on because you've been required to provide the names of the employees who will be working on this issue. It becomes a very regulated space, one with virtually no oversight, one in which doesn't even contemplate significant reporting requirements so that the public as a whole, never mind network providers, have a sense of exactly what's taking place. And note that all of this, at least for now, we don't even know who's going to pay, bear the brunt of all the costs of this. There have been suggestions in the past that the larger network providers may already have some of these kinds of capabilities, things like deep packet inspection and the like, but particularly for small ISPs, those who we very often look to to provide and inject new levels of competition who haven't had the business case for having this kind of, these kinds of network capabilities such as DPI, they suddenly find themselves now having that as a requirement based on this legislation, questions about how long it takes to get implemented, as well as uh, who bears the brunt. So that's the second layer, and believe it or not, there's a third. So it starts with give us the information, uh, no court oversight, ensure that you've got full surveillance capabilities within your network, and then the third layer, of course, is what do you get out of that, the output? And that involves a whole series of new sorts of warrants that, law that would be created to deal specifically with this sort of information. 
Now, we should be clear, because there have been attempts, to, there have been instances in the press where people have suggested that this information is available without court oversight, and that's not true. These warrants are designed to be able to go to a court and obtain a warrant, so there is still court, court oversight. Arguably, there is the balance, but it's important to recognize what's there. There was first off transmission warrants, so we've got this, we've got the, we know who this is, we've got the surveillance architecture built into the network, and now give us all the transmission data uh, relating to the telecommunications that is taking place, including the prospect of real-time information, because we've now worked with you to ensure that you have that, production orders for historical data. We don't know yet how long, from a preservation perspective, all of this will be required uh, to be kept, and this can be this can run for up to three weeks. So start with transmission data, then move to production data. So an order to produce all of the information that you've been collecting as part of all of that surveillance. You can see that it tracks all sorts of things, everything from transmission data, tracking data, even financial data. You're dealing with a particular customer who's using PayPal uh, as a mechanism to pay. Um, you provide them with network services. You don't know what they do, or you don't want to know what they do. Uh, it's put online. They come and say, now you've got to provide us with all the, all the background information about them, about what they're doing, um, and the like. The judge can order some prohibitions, but uh, the reality is much of it's uh, prescribed within the warrant, all, all available to be, to be uh, disclosed. And then finally, orders to preserve. So get the transmission information, produce it, and, get, uh, and preserve all of that information so that it can be effectively provided. Now that's lawful access. Uh, there are many who are deeply concerned both about whether or not this strikes the appropriate balance, but even more what it means for what the network in Canada will look like. Because I would argue that once you establish this sort of infrastructure, once you ensure that all network providers by law have these sorts of surveillance capabilities, that there are these sorts of reporting requirements built into the, into the infrastructure, essentially what you have is something that can't be easily unbuilt. This will be the Canadian network from a lawful access perspective. There isn't really any chance to go back. The bill hasn't been reintroduced yet, but it will be, and I should note that despite successive attempts to bring lawful access forward, it has never been subject to a parliamentary hearing. So it's been brought forward. It's ne we've never even got to the point of bringing it before a committee to have the chance to debate and discuss. In fact, I go even further, frankly, and argue that law enforcement has never even made an effective case um, that many of these powers go beyond, are necessary given the powers that already exist. Uh, in fact, the one example that was provided a couple of years ago came from the then mis minister, uh, Peter Van Loan, who talked about a kidnapping case in Vancouver uh, that he witnessed while he was visiting there with the chief of police and how this would have made a difference. I launched an access to information request with the uh, City of Vancouver Police to learn more about that incident, and in fact it had nothing to do with networks whatsoever. Um, and so it seems as if we still need, I think, the evidence to demonstrate why um, we need to go as far as this suggests. That's the surveillance rules of the road. Closely related are the privacy rules of the road, and just last week, the government introduced Bill C-12, which is a repeat of legislation that was introduced just a couple of years, was in, introduced a year or so ago, uh, and it has to do with our private sector privacy legislation in Canada. When privacy, private sector privacy legislation was introduced in Canada a number of years ago, uh, over a decade ago, built into the law was a mandatory five-year review, so that every five years it was a requirement to review how well the law was functioning and, pr and suggest potential reforms to that law. We're actually now 10 years out. Uh, the law took effect in 2001. Uh, and so we're actually scheduled for the next round of uh, review sometime before the end of the year. Uh, this bill deals with the recommendations that came uh, roughly five years ago. Um, so we had hearings five years ago. There were some recommendations that came out of that. And there are a couple of issues that I think are of note. One consistent with this law enforcement issue is an attempt again to encourage disclosure of information um, without court oversight. And so uh, what, the, what Bill C-12 talks about is in, in part an attempt to clarify what is a lawful authority, something that's discussed in the bill. It doesn't do a very good job of it. It's pretty circular. It sort of talks about lawful authorities being lawful authorities, um, which doesn't really help clarify the situation at all. But what it does do is seek to encourage this disclosure of information without court oversight. And note um, at the, the bottom bullet some of, the, some of the elements that get added into the process. 
because what the government starts thinking about now from a privacy perspective is not just disclosure of information to law enforcement, but a prohibition of that disclosure to the people who are affected. And so the idea is you disclose, you'll be required to disclose increasingly this information uh, to individuals, you have to comply with it, but you can't disclose the information or you're strongly discouraged from disclosing the information to the people who are, who are affected. As you can see here, uh, you have to notify the lawful authority that you plan to tell your customer that you've provided information about their activities to law enforcement and you have to wait 30 days. That 30-day delay is to give law enforcement the opportunity to go out and get a stay, ordering you to not disclose that information um, to, the, to the person who's affected. So that's part of the change. The other big change that will affect many is security breach disclosure requirements. And so, as many of you may know, in the United States, for some time now, we have had security breach in place, or they have had security breach in place. It has proven enormously effective, I think, in raising public awareness of some of the frailty of their information, that it is subject in some instances to security breaches, and creating some very strong incentives for organizations to ensure that they've got the right kinds of security in place. That was frankly exactly um, what researchers at the University of California at Berkeley had in mind when they used this as a potential model that was ultimately adopted. Now I'm sure you know in Canada we've had a number of very high profile cases. Uh, there is mandatory security breach at a provincial level in some places, including here in Alberta, um, where the provincial privacy law has that, but we still don't have it at a federal level. And so what you get in Canada are situations where there may be a security breach. If the organization has Al people in Alberta who are affected, those people may receive a notification that their information's at risk, that there's the potential for identity theft and the like, that they might want to take some precautions to more closely monitor their bills and, and potential misuse of their information, but it isn't necessarily the case that everybody gets those sorts of notifications. The same certainly is true for those that happen to be, let's say, in the United States. People in the U.S. get notified, not necessarily anybody else. This would change that, so this is not to suggest that everything is bad in terms of the digital rules of the road. This is, a, I think, a good step forward. Um, there are two, there's a two-stage process that's envisioned as part of this. Uh, security breach disclosure, so if you happen to be part of an organization that, that faces that situation, what this would have in mind is at first instance disclosing the, the breach to the privacy commissioner's office. So before you go public, before there is the expense of having dis to disclose all of this to the, the broad public and then sort of the implications that arise out of that, disclose it first uh, to the privacy commissioner to determine whether or not this is deserving of being reported to the individuals who might be affected. If we're talking about nothing more than a lost USB key with a couple of information about a couple of individuals, there may be a determination that based on, as you can see, the key, the key factors, how sensitive in the information is, the number of people affected, and the cause of the breach, whether we're dealing with a systemic problem or just a one-off, there may be a decision to say the risk here is very low, uh, and so there's no need to report. There are some who have argued that you should be reporting all the time, but of course the danger of having lots and lots of reports, when as we all know there are lots and lots of security incidents, um, is that this all will just become noise. And rather than having the public pay attention to any of these, this will become just yet another notification that nobody pays any sort of attention to. And so there is, I think, legitimately, a need for some kind of threshold. If there's a problem with this, stand with this it's not the standard, it's the fact that at the moment there are no penalties associated with not notifying. Um, and so we've built a law, but without real, any real ability to enforce, in the sense that if an organization goes through the internal analysis and says, well, you know, maybe we should disclose, but at the same time, what's the penalties if we don't? Uh, the reality at the moment is that there are no penalties, uh, which from a privacy perspective uh, doesn't create the strongest of incentives for people, especially at those borderline cases, to disclose. If the organization reaches the point that there is a requirement to disclose, and so you've talked about it with the privacy commissioner uh, and reached a determination that this is a real issue, it ought to be disclosed, it's on the basis that, as you can see, there is a reasonable risk in the circumstances to believe that the breach creates a real risk of significant harm to the individual. You can see a whole series of different sorts of harms. Of course, identity theft and financial loss are amongst those that are included. Um, and so we're talking about both the risk of misuse as well as the sensitivity of the underlying information itself. Uh, there, are those there are some jurisdictions in the United States that have a lower standard. There are some that have a higher standard. 
Uh, this was actually the result of some offline discussions that took place between the Privacy Commissioner, the government, uh, many in the business community, and some from the privacy community. So this was uh, generally uh, the, the result of a negotiated settlement in terms of what many thought would be an appropriate standard. Um, so that is coming and presumably coming soon. The third area that I want to focus on was, in a sense, electronic marketing rules. And this is actually an area where the rules are already in place. Last year, Canada passed anti-spam legislation uh, that goes well beyond just spam. These rules are in place but have yet to take effect as the government is currently dealing with regulations. I will spare you discussions specifically of the regulations, only to tell you um, that there are those that weren't paying a whole lot of attention to the, some of the rules that I'm about to discuss uh, and now have looked at the regulatory process as a potential opportunity to undo uh, many of the rules that are found within this legislation. And so there is a battle in the regulations, not so much on the nitty-gritty, but out of, out of a desire to, to peel back some of what the government had in mind. I should also note that uh, I served on the National Task Force on Spam five or so years ago, and while I know there are lots of skeptics about the likelihood that anti-spam legislation will do much of anything, um, I'll say that the conclusion of that task force was that it will do a little bit, not a lot, um, this is an issue that requires um, education of the public about um, this sort of messaging, education of certainly those that engage in electronic marketing about what appropriate behavior is, it requires network providers to provide assistance, in some instances the kind of port blocking that, that we've seen that has had some impact, um, and it requires, we found, some amount of uh, legal rules as well, in part out of a fear that um, Canada risked becoming a bit of a haven for the relatively small number of organizations that engage in some of this behavior um, without having the sorts of penalties that many other countries might have. If we've got a good infrastructure in place and we don't have any rules prohibiting this sort of activity, we become a natural place that, that some might want to come to for some of this sort of anti, some, some, for some of the spamming activity. And I'll say that the, the one thing that surprised me the most, those involved in the anti-spam fight for years are well aware of it, is that we know who the spammers are, sort of out of the movie Untouchables. We know where the booze is. We know who, the, we know who these spammers are. It's really a question in some ways of what are you prepared to do? Um, because if you take a look at the Roxo list, the, register, the list of register of known spamming organizations maintained by an organization known as Spam House, you find they list uh, all the largest spam, known spamming organizations in the world responsible for the overwhelming majority of spam that gets distributed worldwide. And we know who these people are, and in fact, we know some of the Canadians that are out there. Uh, there are Canadians on this list, and not only are they out there, when the government introduced this legislation, one of the people on this list, um, a Montreal-based spammer who is currently facing a billion-dollar uh, judgment that Facebook was able to obtain against him, uh, just publicly blogged about the law and laughed at the government uh, for trying to stop his ongoing activities. And so we know that some of these spammers are out there right now, and yet little has happened. Um, here very briefly, and then I'll, I'll conclude by focusing on the copyright issue, uh, are just some of the basics. And I'm going to run quickly, but the, certainly the slides will be available. Note that this applies only to commercial electronic messages. So we're only dealing in the commercial space, not the non-commercial space. And we're talking about a whole series of issues in terms of the key, the key prohibition, one in which sending or cause or permitted to be sending to an electronic message, a commercial electronic message, unless there's been consent and unless there's, you meet the form requirements. The form requirements are, of course, things like basic opt-out, but more important is the need for consent. Because what this law has the potential to do in the longer term is actually to flip our traditional approach in Canada with respect to privacy. Right now, when it comes to privacy, we're largely in an opt-out world. People get, a, in a sense, the one kick at the can. They get to use your information. And if you don't want to hear from them anymore, you say, I don't want to hear from you anymore. Uh, and the law says you, you've withdrawn your consent. They have to stop doing that. That's, of course, the whole basis, for example, of the do not call list, um, woefully ineffective. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the very, well, in part, it was, it was always, it was frankly structured as the do not hesitate to call list since we exempted, uh, <laughs> we exempted charities, uh, political parties, polling organizations, newspapers on freedom of the press grounds, uh, as well as any business uh, that has a pre-existing business relationship, which even includes nothing more than having made an inquiry in the prior six months. Um, once you exclude all of those, it's hard to identify exactly who's left um, in terms of who engages in these telemarketing calls. But nevertheless, um, 
that sort of rant over. Uh, the do not, the, the whole point of the, the do not call list is it's an opt out mechanism, right? I provide my number and now I opt out of your calls. What this seeks to do is flip, it on, flip that on its head by saying I consent first and then you get to market to me. In fact, buried at the end of this legislation is a little provision that would seek to kill the do not call list. Why? Because the do not call list wouldn't be necessary anymore. Uh, if you flip the, the basic premise of opt in versus opt out, you don't need a do not call list because everybody's number is on a do not call list. What you need instead is a do call list because unless you have my number on a do, on a do call list, you're not permitted to call it. Uh, government hasn't gone that far yet, but it certainly has set up the structure to be able to do that. There are many who worry about this structure and what it means for electronic communication, but note that there are a host, just like we had uh, with the do not call list, there are a large number of exceptions that have built, been built in, everything as you can see from warranty and product recall information, the sorts of, kind, the kinds of things that frankly people will want to hear about um, and, and, and we want to ensure are accepted. Although when I had a chance to appear before the committee on this issue, I made the point, as did many others, the, real, the simple reality here is that all you need is consent. Get consent and you can do whatever you like. There are no limits on what you can do as long as you have obtained the person's permission. The fights about all of this are all about, and at the end of the day, we have to recognize that this is what it is. It's all about what can you do without having to ask the person for permission to do it. If, if nothing more than needing permission to, to do any of this sort of stuff. And even there, we still have some implied consents around things like existing business, pers existing business relationships. So for example, if you've got an existing relationship with someone for the first two years that this law takes effect, and note it still hasn't even taken effect, though we know the requirement, you still get to contact those people. So that gives you roughly probably at the end of the day about three years to ask permission once. Um, there are groups out there who are saying this is still far too onerous um, and creates a significant problem for the way in which they engage in online, uh, engage in commercial activity. But no, notably, especially for this, this group, this law was designed to be more than just an anti-spam law. It's designed to deal with a range of other harms, uh, whether we're talking about different kinds of bots and spyware and the like. You can see no altering of transmission data without consent, no installing of computer programs without consent. Um, because as many of you will know who focus on issues around some of the spam problems, the reality is that most spam is now sent by infected machines uh, who have been infected by, with bots that send out uh, large amounts of spam with the users not even being aware of it. This is designed to deal with some of those issues as well. Unsurprisingly, I suppose as well, we've had some software organizations who say we like automated, automated uh, installs and updates and the like without necessarily having to obtain permission and there's been some attempts to try to reconcile some of that. There's also issues around false or misleading information and the like and privacy information too. And then finally there are real penalties here uh, which is why people are looking to see if they can, can limit some of this. Uh, you can see up to a million dollars per violation as part of a private right of action. So you could literally sue spammers um, if you wanted, as well as the prospect of administrative monetary penalties up to $10 million per violation. Those from Canadian standards are incredibly high. It's not clear that they would even be upheld by a court. But the prospect that there are these sorts of significant penalties are likely enough for certainly some, some spamming organizations to take a look at the risk reward and say that the risks in Canada, given the potential for that sort of liability, have now increased pretty dramatically. Um, and so that's what we've got in mind with respect to anti-spam. Now finally, my favorite topic, the copyright rules. And for this, I have to go back just a little bit. I'm going to go back to 2007, although truthfully, I could go back far longer than that. I want to at least just talk about how the evolution of this issue from a Canadian perspective, talk a bit about what the bill that was introduced just on last Thursday means, uh, and then we'll wrap up and have the chance for some questions. And so if we go back to 2007, the government uh, government indicated that it was planning to introduce new copyright legislation. The minister at the time was uh, for local, Jim Prentice, um, and it was placed on the order bill, and as I'm fond of, uh, in December of 2007, and as I'm fond of saying, a funny thing happened on the way to that bill being introduced. Um, it wasn't. 
And one of the reasons, in fact, the reason that was noted in a WikiLeaks cable um, was, a, was this, Fair Copyright for Canada, which was a Facebook group that I started um, about a week before the legislation was going to be introduced. It was a Saturday night. I'm a, I'm a Leafs fan, I'll admit here. Um, and uh, they lost yet again. Uh, they're likely to lose tonight as the season gets underway. Uh, we get used to it as Leafs fans. Uh, and so they, they, they lost yet again. I was looking for something to do. And so I started up this Facebook group knowing that the legislation was about, about a week away. And at the time, Facebook, of course, is still very popular. It seemed like a natural, the sort of thing that if you wanted people to be aware of the legislation, uh, this was something that you could do. And this was at a time when we still hadn't had these massive groups sort of exploding. And so this one started to grow, though. It started with 1,000 in the first day, 2,000 in two days, 10,000 joined this group in a week, then it was up to 20,000 after two weeks, ultimately grew to about 90,000 uh, people with local chapters in communities across the country. Um, we've, we've now become more accustomed to this sort of social activism, of course, and frankly for uh, issues that are far more important than a copyright bill. Um, but at the time, uh, many in the government didn't quite know what to make of it because it was this sort of social galvanizing, using social media in, in a way that we hadn't seen. And so the government, rather than introducing, uh, decided to punt. Now, the media starts covering the story for some of the trade press about the delays to introduce the legislation, and we get the national press picking up both on what was taking place at a grassroots level as well as the decision to delay. Um, my two favorite headlines, uh, the first one that I never thought we'd see, and I know right now we sure aren't going to see, uh, Ottawa, Ottawa one, or actually we do see regularly rather, is Ottawa accused of caving to Hollywood on copyright. This appeared on the front page of the Globe and Mail one Saturday morning. Uh, the, National, the Canadian Library Association actually in a well-timed event on a slow news day on a Friday, uh, holding an event on the issue. And the other, the headline that I still can't convince my kids of, uh, how did copyright become cool? Uh, because it seemed at least for a brief period of time that somehow copyright was cool. People were focused on this issue. We got, there was stuff taking place on television as well. And in fact, a couple hours down the road, Jim Prentice, um, was holding a holiday party just a couple of days before it was on the Saturday. So this group was introduced on, a, on, on I told you, on the Saturday night. The following Saturday, Prentice was holding uh, a party in his constituency, constituency office. And so myself and some other people said, if you happen to be in the area, you might want to drop by um, and spread some holiday cheer. Um, and note that the bill still hadn't been introduced yet. And so, in fact, people did show up, some people driving from as far as Edmonton down, just for a couple of, down to Calgary, just for a couple of minutes with the minister in an attempt to sort of say, we, we, know, we think we know what's coming and we're really concerned. Uh, and so the government actually doesn't introduce the legislation. It comes six months later in June of 2008. Um, and as you can see, Prentice steps forward and introduces what was described as the Canadian DMCA. And what started as sort of a smaller group of people, so relatively large in terms of engaging on a policy issue, back in December now grew dramatically. Industry Canada received about 30,000 physical letters uh, within three weeks of this legislation having been introduced. And this is as people are starting to think about summer camp and the cottage. Other groups start to emerge, not having sort of any kind of physical infrastructure, but using the power, the kinds of things that Clay Shirky talks about in Here Comes Everybody, using the internet as a, as a tool for galvanizing and bringing people together. We get remix and mashup. The government called it Made in Canada legislation. So someone creates a remix of many of their comments as Made Worse in Canada. Those same kinds of Facebook groups that had started to emerge uh, six months earlier, especially at the local level, begin to hold regular meetings and begin to talk about the kinds of things that they can do. It extends beyond Facebook. This is the group in Montreal that creates a wiki all about the legislation itself, all about the local MPs, and they begin to coordinate and talk about the kinds of things that they can do to ensure that they can speak out. Here's the Vancouver group doing the same sort of thing. And I, and I put this slide on just to call attention to at the very bottom here where you can see we're talking about nothing more than a few people, then some people in the city who found one another through Facebook. And suddenly now they're organized enough to have a, an agenda of the meetings uh, that they're having uh, with minutes and the like. We're talking about the sort of thing that typically requires real infrastructure, real organization, and yet now using these sorts of tools, it's the community that comes together. We see at the time what we described as Web 2.0 sort of stuff. 
This is one that I did with my students, where what we try to do is to track the media coverage, with red being negative, yellow being neutral, and blue being positive. And you could click on any one of those and then link to the underlying article to see for yourself. So just graphically show what was taking place. We used Google Calendar to track the various meetings that were taking place in communities across the country. We even had swag. You could get your fair Copyright for Canada t-shirt or mug. Uh, using Cafe Press. Uh, we even had a, we had a YouTube contest, Bill C-61 in 61 seconds, um, where we had people like Ontario Privacy Commissioner Ann Kavukian and uh, the singer Stephen Page serve as uh, judges, um, where people started to create some really cool, quick YouTube videos to try to educate about what was taking place. And Twitter was just getting underway, and we started using that too. All of this having the effect, note that we're now talking about like July, uh, so the parliament's not in session and people are interested in a lot of other things besides copyright. And yet by the end of July, people like uh, conservative MP Bruce Stanton, who's in Aurelia in Ontario, or Soup Dollywall, who is an MP just outside Vancouver, uh, hold town hall meetings on the issue of copyright. In fact, we had some MPs say that this was one of the top three issues that they heard about all summer long. Without big organizations behind all of this, it's just the public looking at what was taking place and beginning to speak out. The bill dies on the order paper when there's an election call. That's a theme with Canadian copyright law. It's introduced and doesn't go very far. And a year later, what the government does is rather than it introduce the bill quickly, it responds to what was one of the top criticisms of many of the legislation, which is that the government hadn't consulted the public at all before introducing it. In fact, the last consultation had been in 2001. Uh, predating the iPod, predating so many of the sorts of things that we take for granted now. It was time for a consultation. And to their credit, the government runs what was a fairly open consultation. I should note that many groups begin to participate. In fact, many groups now begin to take note of what is taking place at a grassroots level. This is what Access Copyright, the large copyright collective, had to say to its members at the start of the consultation. It's a simple fact that users outnumber us. But Canadian users involved in the online debate are so adept at leveraging the internet and social networks to their advantage, there's a danger that your voices as Canadian creators and publishers will be drowned out by the chatter. The, the, the hundreds of thousands of students who pay fees every year to access copyright, or at least have up until fairly recently paid fees to access copyright, I'm sure we're thrilled to hear that their views are nothing more than chatter. Uh, but nevertheless, it, rec it, it reflects the reality that even established groups who at first simply looked at this as nothing but noise began to recognize that this issue was becoming a much hotter issue. And so what we had was, again, the same sort of thing. People, you can see I created this site to encourage people to speak out. This was actually that same Vancouver group, which now created a guide for people so that they could better participate in the consultation. And we get press coverage that suggests that people are beginning to get it. Uh, beginning to speak out, and you, we saw literally thousands of submissions on this issue. You can see here some of them. Now to put all of this in perspective, this is a chart that we came up with uh, together with some students as we went through all the various submissions. There were more than 8,000 of them. Now, I don't know if that sounds like a lot or a little to you, but when the government held earlier this year its consultation on the spectrum issues with respect to the 700 megahertz uh, spectrum, uh, they got, I think, under 100 submissions. We're talking about billions of dollars that will ultimately come out of this um, and huge implications for what our competitive environment take, looks like, both in terms of mobile broadband and wireless issues. Um, and we got about the same number of people in the room uh, as from across Canada participated in that consultation. And so when, when 8,000 people participate in a government policy uh, consultation, again, one that takes place over the summer. They launched this in July. The deadline was early September. Um, it t tells you that people really are paying attention. And so that by the following year, we finally do get a bill. Um, we also get ministers who are far more engaged, at least at the time. The minister then was Tony Clement. Uh, he was apparently busy focusing a lot of different things. Um, but one of the things he was focused on was uh, copyright. And in fact, it's striking to, to contrast um, Jim Prentice's reaction back when the bill was introduced under his watch with Tony Clement's. And so actually what took place um, back when Prentice introduced this was he was asked to come on to a number of programs, say, would you come on and, and respond to some of these questions? And in many instances, he simply said no. This was Clement's Twitter feed within four hours of the bill having been introduced, as many Canadians began to take to Twitter to ask the minister directly 
what some of the implications of the bill, and he took the time to um, respond. And so no matter what you say about Clement on some of the other issues on this, he was far more accessible than any other minister I think had ever been on a policy issue. It was really quite remarkable to see. By now, other groups, uh, once again, had really seen what was taking place at a grassroots level. So this group here, these, all these shiny happy people from a stock photo, uh, are the group Balanced Copyright for Canada, which is the Recording Industries uh, site. Um, and so they launched this site as an effort, again, to, to increase their activity and participation. This is a, a group that um, some behind Access Copyright and others launched on Facebook. This is another one that Access Copyright uh, launched, uh, warning about some of the implications of the bill. Now, that bill died as well in March. Um, but last Thursday was reintroduced, in the words of the Heritage Minister, word for word, not a single comma was changed from that legislation. And so the advantage of that from the government's perspective uh, is that their intention is to pick up where they left off. They held three months of hearings on that last bill. They intend to say we will essentially read all of that in. Uh, there is no need for us to call any, call any of those people back again. We can pick up where we left off and we can have this passed by Christmas, which is basically what their hope. From a public perspective, though, it also means that people who went through the time to assess and analyze all of this now have the same bill there, and so the same analysis applies. One other advantage, I suppose, is from an access to information perspective, uh, there is typically an exception that exists for bills that are live. Uh, but Bill C-32 died, and so I asked for as many records as I could get about Bill C-32 and was able to obtain from the government 50 pages of talking points for the minister, as well as a 150-page document that was the government's clause-by-clause -clause analysis of every piece of the bill. It's the stuff they don't typically make available, but they made available because the exception didn't apply anymore, even though it turns out that they introduced exactly the same bill. And I've now posted those online, so those are readily available online. Let me spend just a couple of minutes talking about C11 and then ensure that there is uh, an opportunity for a bit of discussion and questions. Uh, I described that bill, this bill, as flawed but fixable, um, which was to suggest that uh, obviously it's not perfect, uh, but there's actually a lot of good stuff, I think, in it. Uh, I think the best way to think about this copyright legislation is that there are, in a sense, three groups of reforms. Um, the first group is the sector-specific stuff, which is, in many respects, the something for everybody. Um, part of the legislation. And so if you are a stakeholder group in the copyright fight, you can look at this bill and say there's something in there for me. Uh, there are a series of provisions designed specifically for performers in terms of new performers' rights. There are photographer provisions. It's long been the case in Canada that where you commission a photograph, the copyright resides in the commissioner, uh, not in the photographer. Photographers have objected to that. People who commission the photographs think that's a pretty reasonable compromise. I'm paying for the photograph. I ought to have the copyright. Um, but this is going to change. Many other countries say it's the photographer's creation. They get the copyright and can license it back to the person who's commissioned that photograph. And so that's the change there. There are big changes for broadcasters who currently pay tens of millions of dollars for what's sometimes referred to as the ephemeral ephemeral rights. This is where they take music that might be on a CD and put it on a hard drive so that they play their music off of a hard drive. The act of transferring that music from one format, it's not even a format, from one device in a sense, uh, or media to another uh, has resulted in tens of millions of dollars in annual payments um, and the government would seek to eliminate that. There are a whole series of new creator provisions including new rights in terms of things like parody and satire. Uh, there's a provision in there for remixers. We'll pretend that remixers are a stakeholder in all of this um, with what's known as a YouTube, many refer to as a YouTube exception uh, that will allow people to engage in non-commercial remix um, and have that posted online on sites like YouTube and they can do so knowing that that work is protected, uh, which I think is a really good thing. Uh, there are new enforcement provisions in there to try to seek to uh, make it easier to take down sites that are described sometimes as wealth destroyer sites, the ISO hunts of the world. Um, there are some consumer provisions in there, provisions that uh, at long last allow people to legally record television shows. Um, I know everyone here hasn't recorded any television shows ever because you know it's against the law. Um, so now that will be fully legalized. Uh, there's things like format shifting and making backup copies as well that are designed for consumers, although as you'll hear in a minute, they are all subject to the presence of a digital lock. As soon as there is some sort of DRM or technological protection measure there, those rights disappear. There are some librarian provisions, although they're kind of sucky. There's, there's one that, that we sometimes call the Maxwell Smart provision, which allows librarians to, uh, right now they're allowed to take um, 
for a patron a work and make a, make a copy for them on behalf of the patron. This would allow them to make a digital copy, um, but yet the Maxwell Smart part of this is that the copy has to self-destruct in five days. Um, and so you can make this available to them, but we turn our librarians essentially into digital locksmiths by saying that they have to lock down that content to ensure that it can't be shared with anybody else um, and then can't even be used after a five-day period. There are also some education-specific provisions. We'll talk about one of the broader ones in just a sec. But one of, one of them, again, that, that's sort of similar to that librarian provision is one that seeks to, to, to better encourage distance education, particularly using the kinds of networks that people here run. Um, yet it comes with a bit of a proviso. If you rely on that exception, you're required to destroy the lessons that you created uh, within 30 days of conclusion of the course. Uh, I don't know many students that are anxious to uh, take courses where the lessons they have have to be, the, those, those materials have to be destroyed 30 days later. I know even fewer profs who are in the business of creating lessons that can't be recycled, quite frankly. Uh, and so to the notion that you're going to create those, create those materials and then have them destroyed 30 days later makes this provision basically a non-starter. There are also several areas that, that where the government really has tried to strike a compromise. One is fair dealing. There are those that argue that we, what we really need to help foster and facilitate innovation in Canada is a fair use style provision, one that provides real flexibility. It's not about locking things down, it's actually about providing flexibility for businesses and others that want to engage in innovation. There are others who said, no new exceptions at all. We've got all the exceptions we need. Frankly, some would say we have too many or it's already too flexible. What the government has done is add a series of new exceptions, but not gone as far as the United States. So there are new exceptions for parody and satire. Um, it's hard to believe that those aren't already protected, um, but nevertheless, this would actually protect them. And then more notably, education, which arguably is already covered through some of the existing fair dealing exceptions, things like research and private study, but this would certainly um, fill the gap, so to speak. Crucially for those that run networks, there is also a pretty good standard with respect to intermediary liability, the liability of network providers with respect to the ac activities on, uh, on your networks. The approach, as, as some of you may know, in some countries is what's known as notice and takedown, where there's a notification of alleged infringement, you have to take it down. The approach in other countries is what's known as graduated response, where if you get several notifications about a customer, you might literally have to kick them off the internet. That's what we see in uh, places like France with their so-called three strikes and you're out approach. The government has rejected both of those kinds of approaches in favor of what's known as a notice and notice approach, where the rights holder has to send a notification to the network provider, and the obligation on the provider is to send that notification on to their subscriber. Now, there are those that say, why would this work if there are no penalties at attached with it? And the reality is this has been in place now for five or six years on an informal basis, and it does work. I get emails, frankly, almost every week from parents who have received the notification for something that their kid has done um, and saying, what is this all about? And you know, what do I do about it? So it does have an effect. In fact, the very last hearing that was held as part of the last bill featured the ISP. So there was TELUS and Rogers and Bell uh, appeared before the committee. And Rogers finally provided real numbers on this indicating that about 5% of their customer base had received uh, these notifications, so actually a fairly small percentage given the, given the numbers that are out there, uh, and that their experience is that only one-third of those customers ever receive another notification, and then of those, uh, again, only another one-third of those ever receive a second notification. And so that the reality is, uh, very quickly, it doesn't take more than one or two notifications to find that virtually their entire customer base isn't getting any sorts of new notifications at all. Um, this works because, frankly, there's still a lot of confusion about where the law really stands, and getting one of these potential threats for lawsuits scares a whole lot of people, um, whether or not there is a threat of anything more. Speaking of threats, the one other place where the government did try to strike a compromise is on the issue of statutory damages. At the moment in Canada, uh, each infringement carries the possibility of up to $20,000 per infringement. Uh, a month and a half ago, the copyright owners of the movie The Hurt Locker uh, filed, law, filed in federal court uh, lawsuits, first to obtain the names of subscribers uh, at Videotron, Kojiko, and Bell, uh, with the intent of suing uh, those subscribers, once they obtain the, they had the IP addresses, interestingly enough, one of the IP addresses links back to uh, the Bell Center in Montreal, but nevertheless. Uh, the, but they've, they've, so they've got dozens of these IP addresses. They now have the names and addresses of these people, and it's their intention to follow through with lawsuits. Um, they will seek to settle, though each individual for each alleged download of that movie faces potential li liability 
of up to $20,000 um, for the infringement. I know it was an Oscar-winning movie. I don't think anybody thinks it's worth 20 grand. Um, and so uh, that's where the law sits today. Uh, what C11 would seek to do is actually distinguish between uh, commercial infringement and non-commercial infringement. So where you've got a commercial infringer, that $20,000 per infringement still applies. If you're profiting, it's reasonable to say you got real penalties. But for non-commercial infringement, it creates a $5,000 cap. Now, quite frankly, uh, even a $5,000 cap for downloading a single movie is still high. Uh, but what it does do is at least lower, the, lower, lower this a little bit and create, in some ways, less incentive to launch these sorts of lawsuits in the first place. Go after the real sources of the, of the so-called piracy, not after individual file shares. So th as you can see, this, this sounds like I love this bill. Um, but there is one area where the government didn't compromise at all, and from, from my perspective, it is by far the most important part of the bill. It's the digital lock rule, sometimes referred to anti-circumvention legislation. And what this does is create, in a sense, three layers of protection for a copyrighted work. The Copyright Act still applies and protects your work. You create it, it's original, it's protected. Digital locks, such as technological protection measures, region coding on DVDs, anti-copying technology on e-books and the like can be used to provide a second layer of protection and make it difficult for individuals to do anything, even stuff that they might otherwise be entitled to do, but do anything beyond what the rights holder would like them to do. What these rules do is provide a layer of protection not for the work, but for the digital lock itself by saying that you, if you attempt to circumvent or get around that digital lock, that itself becomes an infringement, even if your intended use is fair, even if you've got a legitimate reason for circumventing, now that act of circumventing the digital lock itself becomes an infringement. And the government was asked during one of the committee hearings about the byplay between the digital locks on the one hand and all the educational exceptions on the other, um, and was asked specifically, is it true that the digital locks trump all the education rights in the bill? The response from one of the senior government officials was yes. And so while there are exceptions in the bill on these digital locks, many of them are very, very limiting and frankly not particularly effective. To give you one example, there's one that deals with those with perceptual disabilities, largely the blind, who rely on these technologies for access. Well, there's an exception for them so that they can circumvent uh, under those circumstances, but that same exception says they can only do so if they don't unduly impair the technological protection measure. Now, the whole point, if you're blind and seeking to have access to the underlying work, is to impair the TPM. That's what you're trying to do because you want to have access. So we have an exception here that says you can't do that unless you don't, if, if you unduly impair the TPM. It simply doesn't work. There are, there are I should note, no exceptions for any of the consumer rights, uh, that the government's introducing, nor for all the fair dealing, for research, for private study, for news reporting, for criticism, review. So let's say you're someone who wants to create a multimedia presentation and you want to criticize a, a piece of a movie and you want to circumvent the lock on that DVD to be able to take an excerpt out of the movie. It's a perfectly legitimate thing to want to do, and yet the law would say that now becomes an act of infringement. Or let's say you picked up a DVD from Asia or from Europe that's region coded to that particular region and you want to circumvent the region coding so you can play the DVD you just purchased, the law says that's an infringement. Or you're a student that's purchased an electronic book as we increasingly move towards tablet computers and you want to be, take, be able to take an excerpt out of that for research and private study purposes, the law says that's an infringement too. And on top of that, consistent with this move towards regulating the technology itself, the law also says that anybody that seeks to, that anyone that distributes, rents out, or makes available the so-called tools that can be used to circumvent the software is an infringer as well. And so even, if we re even as we recognize that there may be legitimate reasons for people to circumvent, we seek to have a ban on this technology. It simply can't be distributed, marketed, rent rented, or made otherwise available. Now that is Canada's digital strategy, or at least Canada's legislative digital strategy. And let me conclude by noting that, with the exception of the anti-spam rules that are now in place, these are still up in the air, at least a little bit. Granted, we have a majority government, one that says they think they struck the right balance and they want to move forward. Um, but we still live in a country where there's the opportunity to speak out. That window for speaking out is closing. It's last call. And so I urge everyone here who is concerned with uh, Canada's digital strategy, can, these sorts of legislative proposals, regardless 
of where you fall on them or what you think of them to ensure that your voice is heard. Thanks very much for your attention. Okay. I think someone has a mic. I didn't leave quite as much time as I should have, but there's still a bit of time for questions. I uh, wonder if you can speak to the uh, issue of the law enforcement regulation of networks and the potential impact on uh, ad hoc mesh networking technology. Well, I, I would say this. I, you know, the, the one, one of the most interesting things that, that I dealt with when I was on the anti-spam task force was talking to law enforcement and coming to the realization how few people within law enforcement were sufficiently technologically adept to deal with any of the lawful access rules to begin with. Outside of a few uh, sort of major metropolitan uh, law enforcement uh, agencies as well as on a national level, most law enforcement, frankly, don't even, wouldn't understand your question, never mind uh, be in a position to, it's quite, I'm quite, actually quite, that may sound funny, but quite seriously, they, they wouldn't even know where to begin. Uh, I don't think that the that this is that even that the kind of those sorts of operational issues are ones that have been given a great deal of thought um, within law enforcement more generally. This is in in many ways what we have, I and mean, quite candidly, is ten years of a fight um, around the sorts of rules of the road and an opening, quite clearly from a law enforcement perspective, for those that have been fighting for this to say this is our chance, um, and so let's get the rules, let's get them now. Um, without, I don't think, ever, ever having made a strong case about how this, these will be used, much less how they get applied once you start getting into what we might see as non-conventional networks beyond what they're able to think of as the, the basics. What, what they're thinking about is, you know, I've got someone who's running on a Rogers network or on, you know, on a Bell network or a TELUS or Shaw network. In fact, it's so clear that that's what they're thinking of, that some of the earlier lawful access proposals sought to exclude for the first three years any ISP with 100, under 100,000 subscribers. Um, if we were serious about, if this is seriously about, at the moment they're saying it's about child pornography, it used to be about terrorism, there was a time when it was about dealing with spam. Regardless of what the particular rationale for these rules happen to be now, if we were serious about it, surely we can conclude that these people are smart enough to recognize that if they want to engage in these activities, there are ISPs out, out there that will not have these tools, at least for the next three years. But yet, that's exactly what the proposal is. Okay. Is it true that in Canada, if you're a participant in a conversation, you're allowed to record a conversation without informing the other party? Uh, the criminal code speaks to... That, that particular issue, and I believe that we're, we're a one-party consent, so if one party consents, I think that's right, but I'm not, to be honest, I'm not, on, I don't, I want to say for certain, I believe it's a one-party consent rule. Um, some places are two-party where you have to inform, but I'm not, to be honest, I'm, I, I wouldn't want to say for certain, so it's a good question. Because, I mean, if that is true, then that implies anything, I assume that would apply then to emails you sent to someone, could, they could then distribute those without... No, yeah. we still have, listen, we still, you know, th th there's been, I, frankly, sometimes unhelpfully, I think a fair amount of fear-mongering around lawful access. I think lawful access is bad enough um, without worrying about uh, rules that suggest that somehow we're, we're entering an environment in which everything can be listened into and everything can be accessed without um, any sort of oversight. I mean, it's possible, perhaps, uh, there are some of these tools out there to, to engage in some of that activity. Um, but I don't think that in the way that the law is currently structured, or at least the proposals are structured, that's what they have in mind. I would actually even go further and say that those that have, have been trying to conjure up some of those images have actually really undermined um, the ability to argue against the real harms. Because what we've seen so far is that uh, you, you start seeing these arguments. Aren't you now in a position, if this goes through, to be able to listen in to anything we do without any sort of court oversight? And the government simply says, no, we're not. And we've really tried to strike the balance. Um, that makes it far too easy. That's the, that's the equivalent of you know, a legislative political softball uh, if we start asking those questions. The real questions are the kinds of surveillance infrastructure that gets built into the network, the removal of oversight, the lack of any sort of even reporting requirements. The UK, for example, has a surveillance commissioner who produces annual reports on the use of these surveillance tools so that at a minimum, 
we can identify how often they're used, how like, you know, some try to make some links between how they're being used and their effectiveness. There are no new reporting requirements being built into the law, so it gets established without any opportunity, even as this unfolds, to identify precisely how it's being used. I guess one observation leading to two questions. Uh, it used to be thought that Canadian privacy laws were good, strong, tight laws, at least compared to some other jurisdictions, so that they favored the individual rights. Mm -hmm. But as you're presenting, these individual rights are being lost. So the, the two questions is one, um, what are other jurisdictions doing? So what is, you just started alluding to what's going on in, in UK, but what's the EU and Australia and other, uh, uh, Germany and other places that had good privacy laws? Wh where are they taking their privacy laws? Right. The other question is, in the same way that uh, you, you or and others um, generated the social movement against copyright laws, is there something that we should be doing against these uh, changes that may be occurring in privacy laws? Sure. Um, okay, so, so on the first question, it's one that comes up a lot and it's frankly part of the government speaking notes is to say we're not doing anything that other, other countries uh, or many other countries haven't done as well. Um, the, the response that I often give when, when that po question is posed is that taking a look at what some of those other countries have done actually is instructive about what we shouldn't be doing, not what we should be doing. Um, it's the proverbial, you know, if your friend jumped off the bridge, would you do the same? Uh, if we take a look at the experience in some other jurisdictions, the one thing that we I can say with, I think, almost absolute certainty is that at some point in time, despite the best of intentions, these powers will be misused and abused. Um, so we can look to Europe as an example where in Greece, uh, they had similar sorts of rules and the tele telecom information, including all sorts of calling information about a number of their political legislatures ultimately leaked out and was made available um, to certain people. In the United States, some of you may know the case involving AT&T, where literally, literally billions of uh, billion, data on billions of calls uh, was all ultimately made available through a backdoor to law enforcement. I think the ex experience in other jurisdictions uh, is instructive about what not to do, not about necessarily what we should be doing. That's not to say we shouldn't be moving forward with lawful access. I think everybody wants to ensure we've got uh, the right kind of security and tools to deal with harms that are very real. Uh, but we ought to be doing so in a way that tries to strike this, the same sort of balance and deals, real, deals with real harms, not isn't just a power grab. Um, in terms of what can or should we be doing, I guess I would say that uh, while you're talking to your local MP or influencer about the importance of renewing the Canary Mandate, um, you ought to be speaking about these issues uh, as well. Um, because the truth of the matter is, uh, many, of our you know, many, many of our politicians, from whatever the party happen to be, uh, happens to be, uh, aren't aware uh, of the details of these sorts of issues. I mean, they're generalists by their very nature. Um, and so they deal with a lot of different issues. And, you know, if they hear from constituents, it makes a difference. When I started doing some advocacy, the one sort of data point that blew me away was we were meeting with, I don't even remember the MP, but meeting with some of their policy people. Uh, and someone asked the question, how many letters from, uh, from your constituency does it take to get, attention, to get, get your attention? And the person responded with two things. They said, first, uh, only, the, the only letters that really matter are those that are coming from my writing. Um, and so what we effectively do is take a look at all the letters or emails or what have you and take a look at the postal code and if it's a postal code in my writing it gets opened and read and considered and if it's from another writing it gets recycled um, because the truth of the matter is I'm concerned mainly about the people I represent and the people who might vote for me. Um, and so these kind of uh, uh, astroturfing campaigns that target everyone are completely useless because the only ones that really matter are people within the writing. That's point one. Point two is on the question of how many letters does it take from a local riding? The answer was two. Two letters from a local riding was, from a member of parliament's perspective, enough to suggest that there's an issue in the riding that they at least ought to um, become aware of. Why? Because frankly, most people don't take the time. Even though we, these, you know, we're busy, we've got lots of other issues, all it takes is two letters from people in their local riding to at least ensure that a member of parliament is thinking about it. And the other thing that people are amazed to learn, we don't live in the United States where access to your local congressperson um, can be expensive and difficult to obtain. If you want to meet with your member of parliament, it is incredibly easy to do so, unless you happen to live 
in a certain Calgary riding represent, where your representative is the prime minister, then it's probably a little tough. Uh, but for most other, uh, in most other ridings in this country, MPs will take the time to meet with you. They come back to the riding and they will meet with you. And so if there, there are opportunities there, whether you're speaking about Canary, whether you're speaking about these issues, or frankly, whether you're speaking about something else, uh, we live in a, we, I think it's great that we live in a place where there really is that opportunity to speak out. One more question, and then we'll wrap up. Sure. Michael, that was a fascinating presentation. Clearly, you have a, a, a real passion for this and grasp of the topic. I'm, I'm interested as a, as a voter and a taxpayer to know your opinion of the level of expertise and knowledge within the bureaucracy of these issues. How confident can we be in our bureaucrats? Um, I, you might be surprised to learn that I think that the, the, some of the bureaucrats on, let's say, on the copyright file and some of these other files are incredibly knowledgeable um, on these issues. The issue is not whether or not the policymakers within government understand some of these issues. Um, it's always been striking to me. You get uh, lobby groups coming in, um, and they, you'll get, let's say, a senior VP or a president of an organization coming in to talk to senior policy officials. And the, the, you know, the senior executive has done nothing more than gotten a than received a 15-minute briefing and a briefing note about the issue, and they're talking to someone who has spent 20 years working and studying on this issue. Uh, government people know a lot about this stuff. This issue isn't whether or not the government knows uh, the policy implications of the choices that are being made. At this point in time, we are dealing with political choices, not policy ones. OK, thanks. <laughs>